sing all three verses here this evening. Wonderful words of life. <clears throat> springtime that's here and Lord we just thank you for the re renewing of uh, life during springtime and uh, Lord I just thank you for a church that we can come to and hear your word preached. Yes. And I thank you Lord for your Bible and uh, what we've learned about it this week and Lord I just pray for the services today I do pray that you would give us a blessing out of uh, what's said be with the speaker open his lips uh, just work through him to our hearts and help us to remember what's said. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It's been, uh, again, it's just been a good time this week. I've learned so much that is, uh, that's been beneficial, so beneficial. And I mentioned it, but um, I have been putting the services on our church YouTube channel. It's just Cornerstone Bible Baptist Church. There's several of them there, so just pick the right one. Um, it's got our logo on it, and um, and I put all of the Bible conference preaching uh, all on there, and it's in its own playlist. It's very easy to find and get to, and uh, I know that I listened. I went back already. I've been listening to them over again, and uh, just trying to, uh, we, we retain through repetition, and I know that's how my mind works, and uh, so just trying to retain some of what I've learned, and uh, so just enjoyed it so much. Connor, would you mind coming up, bud, for helping with the offering? And then, Daniel, do you mind coming? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for, uh, Lord, our, our speaker. I thank you, Lord, for how you've worked this week uh, through him. Thank you for the study, the, just all that he's done. And, Lord, as we take a love offering tonight, I pray that we can uh, just send him away with a token of appreciation. Mm -hmm. Lord, yes. from our church to him. And, uh, Lord, I know so much has gone into the week and so much study, years and years and years of study, uh, Lord. So I just thank you for uh, for Brother Jeff. I pray that you would bless him as he leaves here to the next place, uh, Lord, and the place after that. And I just pray that you continue to bless his church uh, down there in North Carolina, Harvest Baptist Church, as well as 
the ministry that you've given him a vision for, the Baptist History Preservation Society. I just pray that you would continue the work there, that they've done a critical work uh, of preserving our heritage and making it known. So, Lord, I thank you for it. And Lord, I just pray that you'd bless the giver tonight. I pray that you'd give us willing hearts as we give. And Lord, we love you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 special tonight and uh, someone was going to but still having some issues with their voice so I asked if I would and I said sure I don't mind uh, I'm going to sing a song that I've never sung um, by myself before I guess um, I usually sing it in the car because I'm listening to their CD but <laughs> it's a friend CD it's a, it's a friend song called Raise the Standard so I think we all are very familiar with it and uh, it's just a tremendous song written by one of the friend girls um, I think Joanna, if I remember right, Joanna. Yep, I do. If I just look back, my kids, yeah. Can I, can I try singing after? You can try it right now. No, you can sing that one. No, no, you can try singing. <laughs> <laughs> I am still battling a cold, so I can't make any promises on how it's going to sound. Yeah, you no, want to no, sing no. that one still? Huh? You don't want to still sing that one? <clears throat> sure. Okay. <laughs> how about you end, end with that? If you're up for it, you can end. Okay. You can end this thing with your song. If, you, if you're good. Like I got a cough drop, probably. Yeah. yeah. Do it together. <laughs> you know this one? Yeah, pretend you're family. <laughs> 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 All right. <clears throat> there we go. As he marched off into battle, he held the standard high, determined to keep it flying, even if it cost his life. He carried with him no weapon for his own defense. He risked his life to bear the flag that the battle they might win. The battle raged through the day, hard fighting from each side. Through it all the standard was upraised, waving, flying high. As the battle drew near to the end, the soldier still held on. He kept the banner flying, and the battle they had won. Raise the standard, lift it high. Stand for God's word through the fight. Yes, Let others see the banner that will guide them to the right. Raise the standard, lift it high. In this world today, we're assailed on every side, but the Bible is our standard that we raise in every fight. May we always be courageous for we know that God's with us. May we lift the blood-stained banner high through the preaching of the cross. Raise the standard, lift it high. Stand for God's word through yes. the fight. Let others see the banner that will guide them to the right. Raise the standard, lift it high. Raise the standard, lift it high. Amen. 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 Good. Good job. We'll have you sing after if you're up for it. All right. Preacher, you come. I'm looking forward to tonight. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Yes, sir. I'll sit over here so you don't even have to look over there. <laughs> <laughs>
Don't get sick on that part. <laughs> that side's backslidden tonight. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, thank you for being here again at the meeting house this evening. It is good to see what the Lord is doing here in your church. Yes, and thanks again, Pastor, for the invitation to be here and speak about the King James Bible. Uh, thanks. I don't know where Sis is, but maybe she can hear that we're thanking her for the food and everyone who had a part in that tonight. Very, very good. Pastor, ask would I talk a little about the Baptist History Preservation Society. I am privileged to pastor there in North Carolina. I'm in my 34th year. Very early on, we became interested in Baptist history and started doing Baptist history tours. It, um, it went well. We're still doing that. Just finished a couple weeks ago our major tour of the year over in Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana. We also noticed in preparing for the tours years ago that many of the sites, meeting houses, graveyards, burial sites, had decayed. Many of them were never properly marked to begin with. And so we believe that it was a scriptural thing to mark the sites where God worked. Joshua chapter 4. That's what they did Amen. among the Israelites. They were to place those stones so that people could uh, answer the questions of their children in time to come when they ask, what mean ye by these stones? Mm -hmm. And two things would be evident, that there was a work done that should be remembered mm -hmm. and that God is the one who did it mm -hmm. and yeah, he should be glorified. Yeah. And so that's what we try to do. We try to call attention to our heritage and in the process glorify the Lord. So we place memorial monuments around the country. You have three here in Maine. And uh, folks, uh, some of the folks in Maine are pushing for us to place more so that Kentucky that has four will not be in first place, but it'll be in second place. And Maine can be number one. And I'm fine with that uh, because you do have such a great heritage here and it does need to be memorialized. Not so that we'd worship man, right. but so that we would see that our forefathers worship God, and yes. so should we. But we also commission the paintings. Thank you for having prints of those paintings hanging here at your meeting house for people to learn their heritage. We try to maintain both of these works. We, we haven't unveiled a painting in a while, but we have uh, recently in Wisconsin on the tour unveiled a monument to uh, James Delaney, the old Baptist preacher, a pioneer in Wisconsin. The monument was number 26. I'm going to take just an extra minute and tell you about Delaney. He was from Ireland. His parents wanted to bring him up to the priesthood, I wanted him to be a Roman Catholic priest. Now, they died, and he was orphaned, so that scheme was foiled. He left Ireland. He wanted to get away from his country, he wanted to get away from God. He went to England. Finding no way to support himself, he joined the British Army, and they sent him to India, all the way around the world. East India Company, that was one of the British colonies Wars taking place over there. He eventually, uh, not long after arriving in India, was sent to Burma. And when he arrived in Burma, there's an execution of a soldier that's taking place. And he watched that execution, Delaney did. And before the execution, there was a man who prayed. His name was Eugenio Kincaid. And Kincaid prayed for that man and for others, Delaney said that he believed, and he's brought up Roman Catholicism, he said he believed that was the first Christian prayer he had ever heard. Mm -hmm. And Kincaid 
Now, it's interesting. You're running from God. And uh, you can't run from someone who's everywhere. Right. You, you can't do it. And so he ran into God. And there's Adoniram Judson and Eugenio Kincaid, the Baptist missionaries. And he started attending service there where Kincaid preached and he got saved. And uh, he began to help Judson and Kincaid in missions work. And they wanted him to be one of their fellow laborers. He was so gifted. But he said, I can't stay here. I've got to go back. I, I have uh, friends in Ireland. I want to tell them about the Lord, but I'm committed. He's in the army. Judson and Kincaid purchased his release from the British Army. Don't know how they did it, but they did, so that he could leave. And he returned to Ireland for a while and then went to America. And he trained at uh, Hamilton, Literary and Theological Institute, which was started by the Baptists. That's where Kincaid uh, graduated. It's today Colgate University. And yes, uh, Colgate, William Colgate, it is Baptist toothpaste and soap that you use. <laughs> you do. And um, he was educated there, trained for the ministry, pastored a few churches in. New York, and then he went to Wisconsin as a pioneer Baptist preacher and finished out his time there. Planted many churches. We were able to unveil that monument for him. He wound up in Wisconsin because Judson told him, you don't have to come back here. There are as many heathen in the great Midwest of America as there are here in Burma. And he's right. What's a heathen? Somebody who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ right, as their right. Savior. Yeah. So uh, we placed those monuments, eight feet tall, four feet wide. You've seen them. And it's something we hope will be there till Jesus returns. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we collect the books and writings of the Baptist. We have uh, so many of them. They've just recently been photographed and uh, cataloged, put in a database so that we can have them appraised. You're welcome to come there in Knoxville, Tennessee. If you're ever passing through and you want to see the archives, just let me know. We'll make sure that you get in to see them. But... Those are some of the things that we try to do to preserve our heritage. Brand new website, BaptistHistoryPreservation.com. You can see some of the uh, flyers and prints out here on the table or cards that we've recently put together in the display so that we can make it more known as we travel around. Uh, you'll find the app. It'll eventually be available there on the website. Much history. On a daily basis, you'll be able to listen to the recording of the scriptures. There is so much that's there, and we do ask that you take time to look at it, let us know uh, what you think about it. We will try to improve it as we can. Now, you ask that I tell this particular story. Now, there are a lot of interesting things that happen over the years in trying to <laughs> trying to put together tours and actually taking the tours but the first tour to New England, which took place in 1999, I was going up for my last planning trip. There was an older gentleman who went with me because he was unable to attend the tour. Well, this way he'd get to see. And I'm still trying to find a few things, just last minute. So it's a whirlwind trip of New England Baptist history. I'm looking for the grave of David Benedict. Benedict well-known Baptist historian. He was pastor of the First Baptist Church in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. I knew he was buried in that area, Pawtucket, Providence. So at about midnight, uh, we get to this cemetery there in Providence, Rhode Island. And Walter says to me as I opened the car door, I parked outside the gate, he said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm trying to find the grave of David Benedict, and I believe he's in that cemetery. He said, man, you're not going in there this time of night, are you? I said, well, sure. <laughs> this is the only time I have. I've got to go in there. So I said, I'll be back in a little while. I got out, closed the door, and I heard his door open. <laughs> He's coming behind me. He said, if you're going in there, I'm not staying out here. And uh, so we're, we flashlights. We're looking around in the cemetery. And, and uh, the quickest way to do that is just to walk down one row with your flashlight and you're, you're getting all the names and you're basically eliminating all that you're not looking for. 
Of course, Providence was a big Baptist um, area in the day, and so I'm walking along and I sink knee deep into a grave, <laughs> and and I look up and it's the grave of John Brown. <laughs> He's the one who owned the shipping company, the Baptist who owned that shipping company there in Rhode Island. Uh, whenever the British schooner, the Gatsby, ran aground, uh, the John Brown took a ship out there, boarded it, shots were fired. He got all of the British off of there and set the charges himself that blew the ship to the bottom of the ocean. By the way, there's the difference. You're not taught it in school, but there's the difference in Protestants who disguise their faces as Indians and throw tea overboard and the Baptists who wear no disguise and blow entire ships to the bottom of the ocean. There's a difference. It's not taught, though, in school because they don't want you to know what the Baptists did. But I'm standing there in John Brown's grave. He's also the one who built uh, the meeting house, the first Baptist of Providence, Rhode Island. Fabulous meeting house. He built that, paid for it, had it done. And so I'm standing there in his grave, and uh, we're laughing at this time. And then somebody, we hear somebody else laughing. And they're coming at us in a cemetery, and we shine the flashlight over. And the world's fascinated with zombies now. It wasn't quite as rampant at that time, but here comes one. And uh, that's, it's a person, but they're dressed like a zombie. Oh my and right in the middle of the cemetery, it's after midnight, Walter tenses up again. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still laughing. If the one in the grave's not going to get me, I'm not worried about that one out, out there. And uh, it's funny. He began to talk to us, and we realized that on the back side of the cemetery, they're filming a movie, and it's about zombies. Oh and so we didn't walk back there to see all of them, but I think the zombie was more surprised to see me standing in a grave <laughs> than I was to see him. He didn't know whether I was coming or going. <laughs> oh. Uh, just, it's fun to serve the Lord. It really is. Uh, I could tell you stories all night long. It would have you in stitches. But uh, we're going to get into the message. Just pray for the Baptist History Preservation Society. And what we're doing tonight, you say, well, this doesn't have much to do with Baptist history, but it does. Uh, because we are a people of the book. And when people try to destroy the book and corrupt the book, and remove our faith from the book. That's very much a part of our heritage, and uh, we must take that uh, personally. Well, we're going to have some information here for you to uh, use, uh, and at least get one to uh, each each family. I don't know if you, everybody can fold one of these out, but this is a a pamphlet that our church put together. Uh, this is a gift to you. And uh, they're $2 each. If you want to drop $2 into that donation box out there, you can, but it's not necessary. So we're just going to look at this tonight, and you'll have to fold it out <laughs> so that you can see what's going on. It's going to look like this when you get it out. When you get it like a road map, some of you young people don't know what road maps are, but you older ones do. That's another thing we were talking about. LPs, eight tracks, cassettes, and uh, CDs, and all of that. Well, this uh, this is the like a road map. Does it fold back the same? Well, yeah. Well, if you can if you can figure it out, it does. Uh, so. Um, yeah, they, they were folded by machine, so um, I'm glad that they were. But this is a comparison chart. Sometimes um, people want to make a comparison. They know that modern Bible versions do not read the same as the King James. We also understand that modern Bible versions change things that are doctrinal. If they change any word at all, that's a problem. But to be able to show people 
what has been changed and what the problem is with it sometimes makes a big difference in their understanding. And so we're going to go through this. And in order to, uh, to see it, and you can see in red uh, the words of the King James Bible, and then you can see uh, to the left of that uh, the seven most popular modern translations or best-selling translations of the day. And uh, you can see the English Standard Version, which is becoming the favorite of the Calvinist because it does have that bend or slant to it. Holman Christian Standard Bible, that's your Southern Baptist uh, baby now. They spent millions of dollars, and all these people spend millions of dollars putting these modern Bible versions together. Why is that? Because they know they're going to make their investment back. And uh, the New American Standard Bible, uh, this is one that's favored by uh, the the Bible church movement. Uh, the, uh, see, you're a Baptist church. You love the Bible. And some try to attract folks away from uh, the Baptist by presenting themselves as being Bible believers. When they're not, they're using something besides the Bible. And remember we said that every modern Bible version compares itself with the King James? Why? Because they want you to think they care. They don't. Uh, same way with many of uh, the other denominations. Uh, they want to compare themselves with the Baptist uh, to make you think they're the same, and they're not. Do we have anything uh, whereof we might say of ourselves that we are great and we're good? One thing, we know the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, his word and work in us is good. Other than that, we have nothing whereof to boast. You're right. But Amen. our doctrine is better. Amen. Our doctrine is better because it's scriptural. Amen. And, uh, <clears throat> and just think, when we're a Baptist people, we have our faith and we have our book. That's it. It's not that way with other groups of professing Christians. Uh, you take... Church of England, they're going to have their version of the scriptures, whatever it happens to be at the time, and their book of common prayer. Presbyterians, their version of the scriptures, Westminster Confession of Faith. The Methodists, their version of the scriptures, and their book of discipline. Uh, you're going to have the Lutherans, they're going to have their version of the scriptures, plus the Lutheran book of worship. The Catholics have three authorities. They've got their version of the scriptures, the traditions of their institution, and the word of the Pope, all held on an equal line, uh, a plane of authority. The charismatics, they have their version of the scriptures and their experience. That's right. I've, I know it's true because I experienced it. Folks, just because we've experienced something doesn't make it right, doesn't make it true. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's why there's all these modern Bible versions that come out. As people have always tried to corrupt the word, they still do. We know that the love of money is the root of all evil. We'll see that's one of the 66 verses that we have chosen to, uh, to put in here. But we'll see that there's a difference. I know you know that there is, but it's absolutely amazing. You'll see how that the differences will affect the practices of the people who embrace them. And so we'll start, King James Bible, number one, Deuteronomy 23, 17. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. And uh, if you look over just to the next one beside of it, for instance, we're not going to read everything. You'll get the idea. Deuteronomy 23, 17, in the New Revised Standard, none of the daughters of Israel shall be a temple prostitute. None of the sons of Israel shall be a temple prostitute. Well, what in the world is that? Your King James Bible is much more plain. And what you'll notice is that the word sodomite is removed. And by the way, if you want to talk about man with man, woman with woman, there's only one word to use. That's the Bible word. Right. They revel in whatever term the world gives to them. They embrace it. 
except what the King James Bible calls them. They hate it. Why? Because it brings conviction. The word of God always brings conviction. And that word, sodomite, has been removed from all the modern Bible versions. And uh, uh, it's just absolutely amazing. The next one, number two, Job 24, 1. Why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? And uh, you look over to the New Living Translation. Number two there, Job 24, 1. Why doesn't the Almighty bring the wicked to judgment? Why must the godly wait for him in vain? And that means nothing, that has nothing to do with what the scripture actually says. But keep in mind, They've got to make changes because copyright law demands it. And so they're people who do not care about what the Word of God says. Why? Here's what your King James Bible is teaching. Why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? Well, what days are that? That's a prophetic passage of Scripture and his days. And you've got the day of the Lord. You've got the day of God. You've got the day of wrath. You've got the day of vengeance. You've got the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And on and on and on it goes. Well, the question should be asked today. Why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? Why? Because it's been obscured. Uh, his days. And those who know him, you're Bible believers. It's been preached here. You know his days. You know that there are a difference in the days, difference in the application uh, between those things. All of them are talking about the same period of time. His days are talking about the millennial kingdom. The day of the Lord, that's the day in which his will will be done, Isaiah chapter 11. The day of God, you get over into 2 Peter. The day of God speaks of God the creator. He's going to destroy this earth, decimate it. And then he's going to make it new. It's his to destroy. He owns it. He created it. Do what he wants to. But people, you know, you want to know why they can't see his days? Because the teaching is obscured in modern Bible versions, and people don't have an understanding of what's coming. Uh, verse or the third one, Job forty-two ten. The Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. The Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. It's what the King James says. And uh, then you get over to um, the New International Version. Job 42.10, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Well, they're always concerned about money. Well, the Lord restored everything that was taken from Job. Gave him twice as much as he had before. They even includes children. Right. He took 10 from him, he had 10 more. Yes. And uh, so those, those are things. Number four is absolutely amazing. Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Mm. And uh, look at your new revised standard, the wicked shall depart to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. They're afraid of hell. Mm. They're afraid of it. Mm. Now, you're talking about the hymnal the other night and back in the early 1900s there was in this country a movement known as the Union Movement. A man by the name of John Mott headed that movement. The idea was that uh, all hymnals should uh, be modified so that they could be used in any meeting house regardless of the denomination. So they took out everything that was controversial and that's why all the hymnals followed it down to this day. They took out songs about judgment. The Bible says sing of judgment. Took out songs about hell. That's controversial. Anything that was doctrinal was changed or slanted or removed so that people could be drawn together. And that's what Satan wants. He wants a one world religion. And the same thing has happened to the Bible. Well, it happened to the hymnal first. And it's happened to the Bible now. And so thank you for being at a King James Bible conference so that you can understand what people are trying to do with your Bible. 
and how it's being corrupted. And it's, it's absolutely amazing. We talked uh, several times this week about Psalm 12, 6, and 7. Uh, uh, by the way, folks, uh, anyone who dies without the Lord Jesus Christ is going to go to hell. And then at the judgment, at the judgment, the great white throne judgment, hell's going to be cast in the lake of fire. Uh, but as far as the judgment of the nations, the book of Matthew, entire nations who did not minister to the Jews are going to be cast into hell. The wicked, the Bible says, shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Psalm 12, 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words, a silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. I shall keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And of course, the words of the Lord are what are preserved. And look at the New American Standard. Uh, the words of the Lord are pure words. A silver tried in the furnace on the earth, refined seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him, him, not them, but him from this generation forever. They're changing the antecedent there to make you think that the Lord is preserving people instead of his words. And the antecedent for verse 7 is verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. And just subtle changes and most of these. We can't read them all, but you can read them, research them on your own. Uh, but most of them will follow the same as uh, the corrupt one that we actually uh, read to you. But Psalm 75, 6, this is number 6. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. And it's talking about the Lord's appearing. Now, we use the word rapture, which is not a Bible word. We understand what it means, catching away of the saints. But the word the Bible uses is appearing. Uh, the Lord's appearing. That's when uh, he makes an appearance but doesn't return to the earth. He catches us up to himself, catches us away, and we're with him while we're with him the entire seven years of tribulation periods happening on this earth. We're not going through any part of it. And, uh, of course, uh, the Lord's appearing. Now look at verse uh, Psalm 75, 6. This is number 6. For promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. There's one direction missing. Which one is it? North. North. Absolutely. Now, I'm a southerner, but I'm here to tell you uh, that heaven is on the sides of the north. That's where it is. And promotion doesn't come from the east, doesn't come from the west, and it doesn't come from the south. It comes from the north. Amen. Whenever the Lord Jesus Christ returns for us, rapture, appearing, he's coming from the north. When he comes back in his second advent, then he's coming from the east. And, uh, of course, there's, there's a difference, and yeah. Bible believers understand that. You can't mix up uh, the, the two comings of the Lord. Uh, the rapture and the second advent are different. Right. And, and it is amazing that churches, many churches around the world, laid off their cemeteries so that uh, the heads were looking east whenever people would be buried. I don't know which direction I'm pointing. Maybe I got east. Okay, and you got me right now. But uh, that's because they misinterpreted Scripture. They used a second Advent text for the rapture. Now, everybody who's buried looking east that knows the Lord will not be disappointed when the Lord returns from the north. You know, but as Bible believers, do we not have a responsibility? to make sure that we teach the scripture and rightly divide it as we, uh, we should. I mean, you look at uh, the, the New Living Translation. For no one on earth from east or west or even from the wilderness should raise a defiant fist. Where in the world did he get that? It makes you wonder what people were drinking whenever they put some of these things together. Uh, Isaiah 7, 14, number 7, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, shall call his name Emmanuel. Just look next to it, New Revised Standard. It says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son, shall call him Emmanuel. Do you think that the two terms are the same? No. They're not. Uh, young woman could be a virgin, 
but it's not necessarily so that a young woman is. But when the Bible says she's a virgin, she is. Yeah, and uh, that word should be there. And uh, you know why that they don't put it there? They don't believe it. Yeah. People are making modern translations based on what they believe mm -hmm. and not what the scripture says. Uh, there, <clears throat> number eight, we've got to look at that. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut, cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? It's talking about Satan. And the only time the word Lucifer, his name, is given is right here in the book of Isaiah 14, verse 12. That's what he was originally called, Lucifer. That's right. He's not called that now. He's got a lot more names uh, now, <laughs> Satan, the devil, the adversary, uh, so many, the dragon, so many things. But this tells you about a particular time because it's using his name. And it tells you here, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? We know that he was the anointed cherub that covereth the throne, and but he fell. Why? Because he want, thought he wanted to be like God and be above God. It's the same thing he's going to be thinking when uh, he sits on the throne in the temple showing himself to be God. We know what he is. He's a liar and he's a deceiver. But it's absolutely amazing what the Bible says. New International Version, Isaiah 14, 12, number 8. How have you fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn? Well, you know who Lucifer is? That's Satan. Who's the bright morning star? Jesus. That's Jesus Christ. You right. see what they've done? Mm -hmm. They've confused the two. They've uh, obliterated <clears throat> the presence of Satan in that verse and have replaced that with a term that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, there's no difference. <laughs> there's just no difference. Yet, we've only gone through eight. If you can't see that there is a difference already, then I don't, I don't know if there can be any help. Uh, number nine, Micah 5, verse 2, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And uh, you look at... Um, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Here's your Southern Baptist version. And uh, what do they say there? Micah 5, 2, Bethlehem, Ephrata, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from eternity. His origin? What? Does Holman, the Southern Baptist are teaching us that Jesus had a beginning? Mm-hmm. You see, it attacks his deity and his Godhead. The King James Bible says, uh, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Most of these others talk about his origin. Listen, he always has been God and he always will be God. He did not cease to be God when he came to earth. He did not cease to be God when he took sin upon himself. He did not cease to be God when he was put in the grave. He's always been God and he always will. Amen. He didn't have a beginning. That's something that Jehovah's Witnesses want to tell you, right. that uh, he had a beginning, therefore he is not God. Uh, you look at uh, number 10, Zechariah 10, 1, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. How important is every teaching, every word in your King James Bible? Well, it's as important as it gets. And uh, you, you look at the New American Standard Bible. Now, number 10, ask rain from the Lord at the time of the spring rain, the Lord who makes the storm clouds. Not bright clouds, but storm clouds. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you look on over to... Uh, the New King James. Now, this is the one that supposedly only changed the pronouns. Okay? New King James, Zechariah 10, 1. Ask the Lord for rain the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. Not, rain, not bright clouds, but flashing clouds. 
And um, what's the difference? One, perspective. These people who are making these uh, these Bible translations, they're sitting here and they're thinking, as they look up at the clouds, oh, rain, eh? look, the clouds are dark whenever it rains. Can't be bright clouds. You watch the weather. And when they throw the radar up there and they're showing you a storm, the brightest part is where the heaviest storm is. You get an airplane, fly above the clouds. There's a storm raging and it's pouring rain. It'll almost blind you. It's so bright when you look out. It's perspective. You see, man says, well, they're dark clouds. One who wrote the book says they're bright clouds. <laughs> you see the difference? Yeah. The problem is, is people look at this Bible and they have no respect for it. And they think it can be changed. They think God doesn't know what he's talking about. And yet those who are making a word for word translation and translated it, <coughs> the translation is bright clouds. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we find, what, what about that? God does know what he's talking about. <laughs> and, um, oh, this one is amazing. Number 11, and we're not going to, I promise you, we, we're going to start skipping on down the line. But Zechariah 13, verse 6, number 11, one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Just look next to it. New Revised Standard. Zechariah 13, 6. And if anyone asks them, what are these wounds on your chest? The answer will be the wounds I received in the house of my friends. Now, don't you think there's a difference in wounds in the chest and wounds yeah. in the hand? You know what this is prophetic concerning, don't you? The Lord Jesus yeah. Christ of being nailed to the cross. The wounds were not in his chest. Right. The wounds yeah. were in his hands. And uh, it, it's amazing. Just all of that uh, makes... A difference. A number 13, Matthew 5, 22, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. We'll have to read the rest of it. But just look uh, to the New Living Translation, Matthew 5, 22, But I say if you are even angry with someone, and uh, you look uh, at the New International Version, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Was Jesus Christ, did, did he ever manifest any anger yeah, on this earth? Sure. He did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Went into the temple yeah, and he cleansed the temple. But let me ask you a question. Did he have a cause? Mm -hmm. He did. That phrase, without a, or, uh, yeah. without a cause, yeah. is omitted from most of the modern Bible versions, which makes Jesus Christ a sinner, mm. makes him in danger of the judgment mm -hmm. and hell. Wow. But your Bible's got it right, right. without a cause. Mm -hmm. And trying to feed, number 15, Luke 2, 22. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And uh, they're about all the same, but uh, look at your New American Standard. It says, and when the days for their purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. There's a difference between her purification. Mm -hmm. She was fulfilling the law. That was required for anyone who had birthed a man child to come up and offer an offering. But it was her purification. Right. Do you think that God needs to be purified? No, sir. Absolutely not. But when they use the word there, when they just change that, that makes Jesus Christ a sinner and in need of purification. Wow. There's a difference, just one word that's changed makes a difference. And just trying to think about what might um, 
help you the most. Uh, you know John 3.16, we preached about that Sunday, the word begotten. They talk about his one only son, his unique son. And if they don't have the word begotten there, they have ruined a teaching concerning the resurrection of Christ. And, uh, of course, uh, on down, John 14, verses 1 and 2, number 22. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. And my Father's house are many mansions. Many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Um, New Revised Standard, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. You think a dwelling place and a mansion are always the same? Uh, nope, you're not, going to, um, you're not going to get that. New International, in my Father's house, has many rooms. Dwelling places in a New American uh, Standard. Dwelling places in the Holman Christian Standard and rooms in the English Standard Version. So English Standard Version, the Calvinist gets a room, and uh, while others get a mansion. So uh, it's just, a, it's just it, I, don't know what, I don't know how, how else to, uh, to say it. Uh, John 18, 36, number 24, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. <coughs> But now, see the word now? But now is my kingdom not from hence. New Revised uh, Standard at the end says, but as it is, my kingdom is not from here. New Living, but my kingdom is not of this world. New King James, we only change the pronouns. That's all we're going to do. New King James says, but now my kingdom is not from here. They got a little closer than some of the others. And uh, my kingdom is not of this realm, according to the New American uh, Standard. My kingdom does not have its origin here, Holman Christian Standard. Uh, but my kingdom is not from the world, English Standard Version. You know what? When they leave that word now out, what they're doing is removing 1,000 years of future history. Jesus did not say that his kingdom would never be of this world. Because it's going to be. He said, but now, and now, that's what the Bible says, but now is my kingdom not from hence. And the next, John 18, 38, Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Finding him no fault at all. What he's saying in the New Revised Standard, I find no case against him. And uh, in the New Living, he is not guilty of any crime. Uh, you uh, look at the New International, I find no basis for a charge against him. I find no guilt in him, the New American Standard. I find no grounds for charging him, the Holman Christian Standard. And uh, I find no guilt in him in the English Standard Version. Well, certainly he was guilty of no crime. He was not guilty of anything. We know that they had no basis to charge him, but that's not what your Bible says. Right. Your Bible says, I find no fault in right. him. Find no fault in him. And you know what a fault is? Any of you spending any time in California understand that concept. Because underneath the ground, they have fault lines. It's not a place where there is an earthquake. It's a place where an earthquake is more probable to happen because there's a problem there. Now, you and I have faults, faults. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that we are to pray for each other and for our faults. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. You see, it is not necessarily true that we all will give in to our greatest temptation. But we all have faults. Right. Mm -hmm. There are places that we might, or that I might be more susceptible to sin in a particular area than you. Yes. There are some who are given to drink, while others would never be tempted to do so. Those are faults mm. where there is a possibility. 
And listen, Satan can put the pressure on us and we might crack. We shouldn't. The Lord Jesus Christ not only was sinless, he was faultless. Amen. Amen. Faultless. Satan could put all the pressure on him that he wanted, and he'd never crack. Amen. Never. Not, and he did. Jesus never, never could have sinned. It's faultless. Pilate got it right. Yes. And the good thing about it is our future, we're going to be presented before the throne one day faultless. Amen. Faultless. Amen. There's coming a time when we wouldn't be able to sin. Uh, the things uh, that people are teaching in these modern versions, uh, it's absolutely amazing. Of course, number 28, Acts 8, 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, don't you think that's profound in the New International Version? See it? Number 28. Acts 8, 37. Nothing. The entire verse is omitted. It's omitted. It's omitted in the English Standard Version. And uh, New Living, New Revised, it's gone. Just out. They leave it out. Don't, don't even try to explain it away. They just leave it out. And what's it about? It's about baptism. You see, whenever that chariot, the Ethiopian eunuch asked Philip, see, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, what hindered him being baptized? Yes. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Yep. Mm -hmm. Believer's baptism. Yes. Right. Amen. And uh, that's attacked. Why you got people who are putting Bibles together who do not believe that believer's baptism is necessary? Right. They're Protestants. Or Catholic. They get sprinkled in infancy. That means nothing to them. They just leave it out. So that he goes from asking the question, what doth hinder me to be baptized, to going down in the water and getting baptized. Now, we can't let belief stand in the way of you getting baptized. <laughs> and uh, it's wow. amazing. The next one, verse, or number 29, Acts 12, 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people, intending after Easter. Now, all of the rest of them change Easter to Passover, including your new King James. That's right. Change Easter to Passover. Why is that? Because they don't want to admit that there is a difference. Now, it doesn't matter. They say, oh, well, the Greek word doesn't matter. Translation of the scripture is based on a word-for-word -word translation, keeping in mind the context of the scripture. Context always determine what that word should be. And there's a word-for-word -word translation, but here's the problem. We've mentioned this several times this week about back translation. When somebody, some preacher thinks, oh, I've got to make them think I'm smart, or it's expected of me to go back to uh, the original language, and uh, they get their Strong's Concordance or some lexicon, and they go back and they see that the, the word that's there in the text, it's this word, and there are about 12 definitions, including the ones in your King James Bible. So now they have 12 choices. Well, your King James translators already already eliminated all those other choices based on the context. Right. And so now they're going to impress their people by choosing several of these words and saying, now it could mean this, or it could mean this. Well, no, it couldn't. Context tells you what it ought to be. So it doesn't matter what word is in the Greek text. Here at this point, in Acts chapter 12 and verse 4, the word is not Passover. It's to be translated Easter. And how do we know that? Context tells you so. Context tells you. In fact, we're going to open your Bibles and we'll look at this one. Acts chapter 12 and verse 4. I won't be much longer. I'll try to breeze through all this. I'm going as fast as I can anyway, uh, believing that if it's, uh, if it's recorded somewhere or if it's live streamed somewhere or whatever, that you'll be able to, uh, to go back and listen if you'd like. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain 
of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because it, he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the, here's your context, then were the days of unleavened bread. When you look at those feasts, you've got the feast of Passover, and then another feast that comes just after it called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Scripture says, it's a parenthetical statement. Is it just thrown in here? Hmm. No. Spirit of God's put it here because he's teaching you something. Right. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Tells you Passover is done. And when he had apprehended him, verse 4, he put him in prison and delivered him before quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Why can't it be Passover? Like all these other modern versions say. Because Passover's already done. He wasn't going to wait another whole year right. to put Peter to death. Intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. And Herod was not a Jew. Herod was an Edomite right. Roman. Right. Mm -hmm. He worshipped the goddess Ishtar. That's who he worshipped. You can trace her from the Old Testament. Pagans there worship Ashtoreth, the Old Testament. Uh, you get to the New Testament here. Romans, Greeks worship Ishtar. And you, you get over to German. They're going to call her Estra. She's a goddess. They're worshiping her. The English translation, translation is Easter. And yes, Easter is a pagan holiday. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. As Christians, we celebrate Jesus Christ rising again Amen. from the dead. Amen. Not bunnies and goddesses and all that other stuff. That comes from pagan idol right. worship. And it has to do with... Uh, with women. And when he apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. That's what his intent was. Mm -hmm. Your King James Bible is the only one that's going to have a translation that helps you understand context mm -hmm. and meaning. The only one. Oh, and they hate it. They absolutely, that's one of their most hated ones. We got rid, get rid of that word Easter. Yeah, you don't want anybody to know that that's who you're worshiping. And um, that's, it's just that simple. And um, you, you have places like number 31, Romans 120, where it talks about the Godhead. That word is removed from nearly every one of these modern versions here. And uh, we'll turn it over, turn the page over now. We're on the, the back side, and we, uh, we'll look at number 35. Romans 8, verse 33, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And then we'll look on over to... Uh, number 35 under the English standard. Uh, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Now, let's talk about the elect for just a moment. First time the words mentioned in scripture is in Isaiah chapter 42. Mine elect, and then Jesus Christ quotes that passage in Matthew chapter 12 and says it's talking about him. So the first time that the word elect is mentioned in Scripture is talking about Jesus Christ. The second time it's mentioned in Scripture is Acts chapter, Isaiah chapter 45. Jacob, mine elect, is talking about the Jews. Third time, not the third time it's mentioned, but the only other usage in Scripture is in 1 Timothy chapter 5 where it talks about elect angels. Now, we cannot be angels. It's not talking about us. We know. So there are only... Two other definitions that your Bible uses for the word elect. And it holds true in every other place that the word is used in Scripture. It's either Jesus Christ or Jews. Every time. Mm. Never talking about Gentiles. Never 
Calvinists don't want you to know that. Why? Because they want you. They want to think that they're somebody special. The Lord died for him, but he didn't die for everybody. You know, we're getting in, but not everybody's getting in. We don't have to spend time in heaven with them. And uh, just it, it, that's where it comes from. That's the ultimate of replacement theology. Now, you have to understand that the word elect is either talking about Jesus Christ, Jews, or angels in order to understand passages like Romans 8 and verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Well, who is God's elect? It's Jesus Christ. It is God that justifieth. Do you know how God justified us? He put our sin on Jesus. That's right. You understand what a charge is. It's something you owe. Something must be paid. And the question is, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Only one person could. The Father. That's right. The Father laid your sins and my sins on Jesus that's right. in order to justify us. That's good. But that's not what your Calvinists think. And you see that in the Calvinist version over there, the English Standard Version. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Now we're not talking about a charge made against him. That's the same problem when they had when uh, they were talking about Pilate saying, I find no fault in him. They're trying to talk about Jesus being charged with something. Didn't have any basis for a charge. Well, if they knew or thought that when he was talking uh, or standing before Pilate, then why do they say that there is a charge against mm -hmm. God's elect? Did the father look at Jesus and say, you're guilty? You sinned? No. You were wrong? Mm -hmm. No charge ever could be made against Jesus. Right. That's right. The Lord Jesus Christ willingly yeah. took sin upon himself and was made sin for us so that God could justify us. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you misunderstand who the elect are, your Bible doctrine is going to be fouled up from start to finish. That's why over there in the book of Matthew, when Jesus is returning in the second advent, mm -hmm. he gathers together his elect. People say it's the rapture. No, it's not the rapture. No when he comes in the rapture, he's going to gather the saints right. this way. Yeah. When he comes in the kingdom, he's going to gather his elect this way. Yeah. They're going to be gathered around him as he rules and reigns there yes, in Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a difference. <laughs> but if, if you think you're the elect then you're going to have a lot of passages of Scripture that are fouled up. Sorry, spent a little bit too much time on that, perhaps, but it's, it's important to see. Uh, look at 37. Uh, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Look at New Revised Standard, 37. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The Bible doesn't say that the message... Is foolish. It says the preaching is. The right. world doesn't understand that. You get out on the street and you preach, what's that fool doing? People who are lost, they come in here, they've never heard preaching before, and your preacher stands up here and preaches, and they, what's he getting excited about? <laughs> it's not the message that is foolish. The world thinks the delivery is. And your King James Bible's got it right. These others uh, have it wrong. And uh, same thing you get there in the next passage, 1 Corinthians 1 at verse 21. Um, look at number 40. Uh, be ye, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be ye followers of me even as I also am of Christ. You look over at the new King James, number 40, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, it says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Mm. Imitation and following are two different things. We are to follow our apostle, the apostle to the Gentiles, yeah. as he follows Christ. Yeah. Mm. We will believe as he believed. We will follow the words that the Spirit of God gave him to pen. We don't imitate him. What part of his life are you going to imitate? The death part? Hey, somebody, it's time for you to put me to death. No, but you are going to follow him where he went. Mm -hmm. if you believe on the same Lord. Um, 
look then at uh, 46. Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And uh, you just, just pick whichever one you want to. And uh, every one of them, as I'm quickly uh, glancing across here, yes, every one of them changed the word temperance to self-control. Every one of them. There's a great difference. Some of you may work in places where a manufacturing is done. And if you temper something, that's a mixture that's added to another to either make it stronger or softer. You temper something. We have the wrong habit of saying, I lost my temper. You won't find that in scripture. You might have gotten angry. Now, you didn't get mad. Dogs get mad when they're rabid. Uh, so it's wrong for us to say we're, we get angry. And whenever someone gets saved, do you know what's added to you? Spirit of God. That gives you strength that you didn't have before. And at times, it makes you softer Amen. That's good. when you need to be. Amen. A temper is a qualifying mixture mm. that makes you what you ought to be. Okay. That's temperance. When you're talking about a fruit of the Spirit, that's God control. Mm. Amen. That's good. Self-control is Amen. entirely wrong. Yes. You know why they don't understand? I suspect it's because they may not have the Spirit of God in them. Um, I, that, that's a suspicion. I'm not saying it's that. It's a fact. But uh, so many things here. But number 53, the love of money, we've talked about that. That's what all of this is about, really. And um, uh, 55, 2 Timothy 2, 15, study to show thyself approved. Uh, they change it. Do your best to present yourself uh, to God. Work hard so you can present yourself. To God. Listen, you're not going to present yourself to God to begin with. Lord Jesus Christ is going to present you to him. Be diligent. Do your best. Be diligent. Be diligent. Do your best. Not study. Hmm. Study to show thyself approved unto God. You remember over there, we talked about it, I think it was last uh, evening. Uh, uh, Stephen, hmm. Acts chapter 6. Look ye out from among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. How did they know they were full of the Holy Ghost? Uh, the ones who... New scripture. Study to show thyself approved. How were those men approved? Full of the Holy Ghost. They studied. How are we approved? It's people who study the word of God. Those are the ones who are approved by God. And that word study. Oh, they hate it. They, they don't want you. You understand? They don't want you studying. They want you to do your best. They want you to be diligent. Why they're trying to work their way in. Right. So study has nothing to do with it. Wow. They think this is talking about somehow uh, getting into the presence of the Lord. 56, 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Uh, in New Revised uh, Standard Version, indeed all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's not so. And that's not what your King James Bible says. The Bible does not say that everyone who lives a godly life will be persecuted. It does not say that. In fact, in your minds right now, some of you are thinking about people who are with the Lord that lived godly lives and were never persecuted. The scripture does not say everyone who lives godly will be persecuted, though that's what these modern Bible versions want to make them say. And I suspect that Baptist preachers who are standing in the pulpit preaching that error might have gotten their ideas from some of these modern Bible versions. And listen close sometimes. that You ought to pay close attention to the people who are preaching to you because you can learn a lot about where they've been studying by the things that they say. Uh, you look at the context there in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
and you understand that the Apostle Paul, being moved by the Spirit of God to give his testimony, he talked about persecutions that he endured. He endured. Your King James Bible defines itself. The de definition of suffer is to endure. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, it shall suffer persecution. It means you'll endure them when they do come. That's what godly people do. They endure. They suffer persecution. Suffering is not what happens. Suffering is the spirit of the person who's being beaten. And that's what the, that's what the scripture says. And, and it's plain uh, that it says that. Um, number 60. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. That's talking about the incarnation of Christ. He didn't become an angel. He took upon himself the seed of Abraham. He uh, was incarnate. This is God in flesh. Yes. It's not a fleshly God. Right. It's not part God and part man. It's not 100% man, 100% God. It's a 100% God in the likeness mm. of sinful flesh. Mm. Uh, if he had been any part man, he could not have been our Savior. Mm. This mm. is God in flesh and uh, and it is for it is clear uh, number 60 under the new revised for it is clear that he did not come to help angels but the descendants of Abraham it got anything to do with whom he was coming to help wow. it's how he came and uh, it, it's it's amazing mm. uh, problem is you have the difference between the King James translators and I know they were just men but they were students of the Word of God they knew the scripture. And the, these modern people, they don't know the scripture. They wouldn't understand. It's evident they don't understand it. And, and that's sad. It, it, really is. it really is. 62, absolutely amazing. Hebrews 4.15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Just look at um, the New International. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. That's not what the Bible teaches. Right. He was not tempted with every sin. Mm -hmm. He was not. But he was tempted in all points, mm -hmm. like as we are, yet without sin. What are the three points of temptation? It tells you over there in First John chapter 2. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Yes, Those are the points of temptation. Yep. He was not tempted with every sin. That makes them feel good maybe to think, well, we're just like Jesus. No, we're not. We'll become more like him if we get saved and submit to the Bible. But we're tempted with things that the Lord Jesus Christ was never tempted with. But we are, every one of us, only tempted with three points. Of sin. Right. You find those three points there in Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was tempted. Yeah. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Adam failed. Jesus passed with Amen. colors. Yes. We fail. Yep. That's why we need him Amen. who didn't fail. And um, you were singing. Hark the herald angels sing. Second Adam from above. Yep. Second Adam. Yes. But the first Adam didn't get it. Second one did, Amen. and uh, praise the Lord for it. But number sixty-three, confess your faults one to another. Here we are to those faults again. You know what a fault is. Confess your faults one to another. Look there next to you, New Revised. Therefore, confess your sins one to another. New Living, confess your sins to each other. New King James, confess your trespasses to one another. New International, therefore confess your sins to each other. New American, therefore confess your sins to one another. Holman Christian Standard, therefore confess your sins to one another. English Standard, therefore confess your sins to one another. Would you agree with me there's a difference between a fault yeah. and a sin? Yeah. Do you know what professing Christian religion it is that teaches you that you must confess your sins to another person? Roman Catholicism. Right. They'll even build you a nice little booth to get into and do it. 
Man has no business hearing a confession from another. No, you confess your sins to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. But we can confess our faults to one another. I mean, would it be wrong to, uh, to, to say, you know, I, before I got saved, I was a drunkard, and every once in a while it still tempts me, and I'd like for you to pray for me that God would shore up that fault. And I'd not be tempted. You see, that's scriptural. Confess yeah. your faults one another. Right. Confessing your sins. Listen, I went out last night and got smashed. Nobody needs to know that. <laughs> if you did, get it right with God. And don't give somebody else something to keep in their minds. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and by the way, when, when you stand and give testimony, thank God for what he's done for you, but don't tell everybody what he saved you from. That's not necessary. Why is it not necessary? Well, look at the last one, number 66. Revelation 1, 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. And there's that ties in with John three sixteen, And the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Washed us from our sins in his own blood. Look at there, new revised, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins. <laughs> freed us from our sins and new living. Um, you look at new international, him who loves us and has freed us from our sins. Copycats, you just got to get that 17%. Uh, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by the blood, new American standard. Uh, to uh, him who loves us and has set us free. By the way, you're not set free. You're made free. Amen. And there's a difference. Yes, sir. You can set a prisoner free, and he can go out and uh, do the same thing again, get right back in prison. Right. You've been made free Amen. from your sin. Amen. And uh, you won't ever have to pay for it. Uh, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. No, he has washed us from our right. sins in his own blood. And our sins are not cast as far as the east is from the west, Israel. Our sins are not under the blood, Old Testament. Our sins are not covered by the blood, Old Testament. Our sins have been washed away by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not under anything. They're not covered by anything. They are gone. Aren't you glad you have a Bible? The Bible just teaches the truth. We'll take the time to study it. And this is just a chart. Uh, you, you can study all you want to, take it with you, uh, look it over, and look at the things that we didn't talk about, and see the difference. And when you're ever, you ever have the opportunity to talk with someone who is using one of these other versions, you could be kind, you can be tactful, but you can say, hey, what about this verse? Can you explain that to me? Well, that works really well if somebody's got an NIV and you take on Max 8 and verse 37. Mm -hmm. You ask them to explain that verse and they're going, it's not here. Bingo. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> That's amazing. A preacher, you come. Thank you, folks, for your attention. Time. It does fold back up the way you gave it. Gave it on. <laughs> what breaks my heart is to see my Lord attacked. Yep. To see his deity stripped from him. To see the virgin birth removed. To see to see him made into a created being rather than God who created breaks my heart. Uh, so glad that we have the truth. Amen. Amen. That we can hold it in our hand. We can read it, study it. We know <laughs> that we can we can know the truth. Yeah. Yes. What a God that we serve. He's so good, so good to us to give us his word. Yeah. We didn't deserve to be saved, but he saved us. Amen. 
We don't deserve to have the word of God, but he gave it to us. Yeah. So many, so many are, are lost. I mean, think of how the devil has worked from, from Genesis 3. What did he do? He distorted God's words. Mm -hmm. What did he do with Christ? He tried to distort God's word. We're not ignorant of his devices. This is evidence, isn't it? Of every way in which we see a distortion and man distorting, sinful man distorting God's word. It really, truly is It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking that people believe this as the truth. They believe the lie. They believe the lie when they believe that Jesus was created by God. When they believe that Jesus was not born of a virgin. It's heartbreaking. Well, let's close in prayer. I'd encourage you to... We have... I, I forgot. We have dessert. We have Amen. dessert. And uh, so we're going to pray. And I encourage you, if you can stay for dessert, to stay for dessert. We have something special. Uh, today's Victoria's birthday. And uh, Brother Jeff actually came by earlier much earlier today, and he dropped off some cheesecakes. Amen. And uh, so we're going to have cheesecake dessert. And uh, so make sure, too, you wish Victoria a happy birthday. But we'll pray. And if you can stay, we'll get the cheesecakes out here as quickly as we can. And uh, once we get over there, we'll, we'll sing a quick happy birthday, and we'll, we'll enjoy some cheesecake and some fellowship. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much yes. for who you are. Uh, Lord, you are. Uh, you are God. You're a great Savior, a great God. Uh, Lord, you're a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. <laughs> Lord, I thank you for the truth. I thank you that we have the truth. I, I think of the early years of when I first got saved, not knowing any better. My first Bible was a New King James Version. I'm so thankful for being installed into a church, Churchill Baptist Church, that taught out of a King James Bible, but not only that, they taught me why a King James Bible. Why it's so important to have a King James Bible. Yes. And it's because it's the truth of who you are. Yes. Because you've given us the truth and things that are different are not the same. And Lord, I'm thankful. I am so thankful uh, that, that, that there was a church that stood upon the truth, that preached the truth, and then taught me why, why I needed the truth. And Lord, and my heart breaks for those that are led astray, led in a lie. Uh, Lord, and this is a great resource for us to help them see. And not in a mean, hateful way. Hey, I got something you don't. Or, hey, mine's better than yours. But in a, can I show you something? Can I show you something? Because I love you and I care about you. And I want you to have the truth. I want you to know the truth. And here it is. So Lord, I pray you'd give us boldness. I pray that you'd help us to be students of the book. I pray that, Lord, that in all that we do, we'd know why we do it. We'd use the Bible as the, as the source. Uh, why do we do what we do? Well, because the Bible says that we need to do this. Mm -hmm. And no other reason than that. And if we don't know why, we need to, we need to search the scriptures and find out why. Lord, I thank you for this week. I thank you for the meeting. Lord, again, I pray you bless Pastor Jeff, his church, the ministry, the Baptist History Preservation Society. I know they have so much planned of things to do, things they want to do, and I'm thankful for the three markers that are placed here in Maine. In Manchester, Maine, at the, at the Manchester Meeting House, there where Isaac Case pastored and, and really started a mission work that saw 300 churches planted here in Maine and, and up into Canada. Uh, Lord, I'm thankful for the Daniel Merrill up in Sedgwick, the, the monument there, and the painting across the hallway here from us, and a man that uh, they got say, or they, that, that came to a, a point of, of seeing the Scriptures, studying the Scriptures, and, and believing the Scriptures, that it is believer's baptism. Mm. It was converted from a congregational preacher to a Baptist, and then ordained as a Baptist preacher, pastored the largest Baptist church in Maine, at a time where the Baptists were the most, the most predominant 
the denomination, whatever you want to call it, the most predominant in the state of Maine in the early 1800s. We've gone, we've gone so far away from that. Uh, Lord, and then in Augusta, Churchill Baptist, the, the Baptist history, uh, just in general in our state, so rich a heritage. And Pastor Jeff pointed out last week that history and heritage are two different things. Heritage is what we, what we live. We continue to live. Those that went on before us and were persecuted, even all the way to their death, but stayed faithful to the book. We live, we live that same heritage, that same lifestyle. The Lord, if persecution comes, we would remain faithful. That if we are persecuted unto death, that we would remain faithful, just as those that went on before us. So Lord, I thank you for our heritage. I thank you for the word. I thank you for Christ. And Lord, I pray you'd bless the food, the fellowship, our time together, the remainder of our time together. I pray that you'd bless the meeting over at Bible Baptist the rest of the week and then on to uh, up at Dover Foxcroft next week and, and then over to Truth Baptist Church, a continuation of, of that work that Isaac Case started in the 1800s. A continuation, Truth Baptist Church, is not a continuation by name. The First Baptist Church is still there, but a continuation in the markers, the Bible doctrine that they follow. As far as I'm concerned, the First Baptist Church is not recognizable anymore when you compare it to the Bible. So many churches have gone away from the Scriptures. And Lord, I pray you'd help our church to be a church of the book. Lord, that it would be our rule, our measure, our guide in all that we do. Lord, we'd be committed to it, unwavering. Lord, I thank you for the Bible. I thank you for the conference this week, and it stirred my heart. And Lord, I thank you for it. I thank you for Pastor Jeff being willing to come up and, and to teach us this week. Lord, I pray you'd bless. I pray, Lord, you'd give us safety as we travel home. Lord, I pray that we'd continue in our study and have a desire of study in, in your word. We love you, Lord, and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.